Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, which is brought to you by Chair Instruments Waters in partnership with Azo Network and Azon, and is titled Comprehensive Rheological Characterization to Optimize Electrode Manufacturing. Uh, a big thank you to everyone involved in making this event possible. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes, but before we do, let me first introduce today's speakers and explain a little bit about the format for today's webinar. So today's webinar will run as two parts, a presentation and Q&A session, and we're delighted to have Mark Stubb and Sandeep Paul present for you today. Mark is currently an application specialist in the Global Applications Group at TA Instruments. Uh, Dr. Stobb received his Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry at Gettysburg College and subsequently earned his PhD in Material Science and Engineering at Drexel University. He has published seven first author peer-reviewed articles, various co-authored articles and several application notes. Uh, in his role at TA Instruments, he leads the theory and application courses on rheology and mechanical analysis. And presenting second is Sandeep, an application scientist under the Regional Applications Group at TA Instruments. Dr. Paul received his Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineering at Virginia Tech and his PhD in Polymer Engineering from the University of Akron. He specializes in rheology, polymer processing, composite materials, process development, and R&D. He has co-authored five peer-reviewed journal articles on the topic of rheology. In his role at TA Instruments, he consults with customers and leads training sessions on rheology and dynamic mechanical analysis. Big welcome to you both today. We have a few points about how to get the most out of your experience today. Firstly, the event is being recorded and we'll be sharing the on-demand link with you within the next 24 hours. So if you enjoy what you see or have a colleague up here who might benefit from seeing the content as well, then please consider sharing with them internally or via your social media channel of choice. If you experience any technical issues, then they are normally resolved by refreshing your browser. But if this doesn't work, then send a message using the Q&A box and our backend team will get you back up and running as quickly as possible. We'll be running a couple of audience polls today, the first of which should be appearing on your screen now. Uh, so we're interested to know which areas of the battery supply chain you're currently working in. Uh, please check all boxes that apply to you there. And whilst doing that, a final reminder that there is an audience Q&A following the presentation. So do send any questions in as and when they come to mind. And we'll answer as many as we can following the presentation today. A quick note that if you are watching this back on demand, you can still ask a question, but you'll receive an answer to your question via email. All right, now let's get things started with the presentation. Mark, over to you. Hi, and thank you for joining our webinar and utilizing comprehensive rheological characterization to optimize electric manufacturing. I, along with my colleague, Sandy Poole, a rheology specialist at T Applications Group, in this talk, we will take you through electrode powder and slurry characterization capabilities from TA that can enable early stage optimization and cathode and anode production. The process of manufacturing an electrode begins by mixing an active anode or cathode material with a binder and conductive additive in an, in an appropriate solvent. The slurry formed is then coated on a metal current collector the coated slurry is then subsequently dried and calendared to produce an electrode with a desired density and porosity. When producing electrodes, the main goals are high uniformity, good adhesion to the current collector, and low cost. Challenges facing slurry production include adequate early stage characterization of the slurry formulation and the high time and cost that can be associated with the solvent removal process. Now let's look at the three main components of the electrodes. Active material, polymeric binder, and conductive additive. The active materials are the cathode and anode components that directly take place in electrochemical reactions during battery charge and discharge. The selection of these materials is directly related to the final battery parameters such as voltage, range, and capacities. For cathodes, these include lithium metal oxides, LCO, LFP, and MC, and for anodes, it is generally graphite. The binder is used to form a physical network that adheres the active materials and additive particles together and bind them to the current collector. The binder also serves as a viscosity modifier and ensures a stable network in the slurry state. The most commonly used binder for the cathode is PVDF, and for the anode, it is usually a combination 
of carboxymethylcellulose and styrene butadiene rubber. The conductive additive is used to form a conductive network between active electrode components and the current collector. Carbon black is generally used for both the cathode and the anode as a conductive additive. Proper mixing to ensure a uniformly coated conductive network is key in electrode manufacturing and the ultimate battery performance. Ensuring quality in the slurry through the entire process is key to desired electric performance. Here the process is broken down into materials and properties that need characterized throughout the manufacturing process. For the incoming materials, these include, include the thermal stability, the purity, and the structure, and as we'll talk about very shortly, the powder properties. When the slurry is made, important properties include the solids content, the viscosity of the slurry, the thixotropy, the stability, and the dry kinetics. After drying the final electrode, important characterizations will involve proper composition and also proper structure of the slurry. The main components of the electrodes are in a powder form when they are sourced. Understanding the powder's bulk properties such as bulk flow and cohesion under shear are key for pre-slurry processing and mixing. There are several important processes and properties involving the powders that must be understood for, for the efficient manufacturing of the electrodes. First one we'll focus on is the dry mixing process where components are mixed prior to the introduction of solvent. Variations in the component powders can lead to inconsistencies in formulations. This process is being increasingly important to understand as reduction of solvent and dry coating processes are being explored in order to eliminate the high cost and negative environmental impact of solvents. This is especially true in cathode production where, this, where the solvents tend to be fairly uh, toxic to the environment. Additionally, the agglomeration, which we'll um, talk about how it relates to the cohesiveness of the powder and the flowability properties are going to be key factors in the powder storage and transportation processes as well. The two powder accessories we're going to focus on in this talk are going to be the flow cell shown here on the left and the shear cell sh shown here on the right. The flow cell works by moving a helical or twisting T-type rotor up and down through a powder bed while applying a predetermined rotational velocity to the rotor. This will give us a measure of the bulk flowability of the powder. The test is going to be important for processing involving powder transportation, such as dispensing or seen here, um, dispensing into a trough or going through a hopper uh, with flow, and also the stability of the powder. The shear cell shown on the right works by applying a known normal or axial consolidation force on the powder, and then followed by an application of a shear. This is gonna be sensitive to the inner particle interactions in the powder and provide information such as cohesion and the yield strength of the powder. And we'll see how cohesion is gonna be important for preventing or um, controlling the amount of agglomeration you may have in your powder and the yield strength will give an indication of how easy your powder is to flow. We'll get into the examples here by starting with a graphite, um, graphite anode. This is the most common active material in lithium iron battery anode electrodes due to its good electric electro performance, abundance, and low cost. In order to obtain useful powder properties, a yield locus analysis is used to transform the normal and shear stresses from the shear experiments into a 2D representation termed Morse circles, as shown here on the right. From this graph, the cohesion can be determined as the y-intercept, and the yield strength can be determined for the x-intercept of the smaller Morse circle shown here on the left side of the graph. In this example, it shows two synthetic graphite samples from two different sources, a commercially purchased one and an industrial purchased one. Overlaying the Mohr circles allows easy comparison between the two samples where a higher cohesion and higher yield strength is, is observed for the graphite obtained from the commercial source, blue curve here.
This shear analysis can also be coupled to imaging in order to correlate the bulk powder properties with the material's microstructure. On the left, we have SEM images of natural and synthetic graphites that are sourced from either commercial or industrial sources. The particle size and size distribution along with morphology and surface texture are very different depending on the source as can be seen in the images. Looking at the shear data on the right, this clearly influences the bulk powder properties as well. The biggest difference is seen between the commercial samples where the synthetic grade shows a high cohesion and yield strength. This is expected to translate to more agglomeration under storage due to the higher cohesion and more energy input required to initiate flow during processing as indicated by the yield strength for the synthetic grid. Utilizing a different supplier and maintaining a natural or synthetic grade also shows differences. With this type of analysis, a manufacturer can optimize the anode formulation with the graphite source they choose. As mentioned previously, there is a push to reduce and replace solvent in the manufacturing process because of the unwanted time and cost it adds. Doing this requires dry mixing of the electro components and then subsequently characterization to determine powder properties to optimize the dry coating process that is required without solvent. In this next example, we have an NMC-based cathode powder that's analyzed where the carbon black, the conductive added component, and the PVDF binder ratio is altered. The shear results on the right side show that decreasing binder increases the cohesion and yield strength of the powder, as shown in the table below. Another observation is that the flow function increases with increasing binder content. In the case of a shear cell experiment, the flow function equates to the ease in which powder particles can flow past one another, where if we have a higher flow function, it means the powders can more easily flow, the powder particles can more easily flow past one another. To explain these observations, we can turn to the imaging. The images on the left have the lowest binder concentration on the top left and the highest binder concentration on the bottom left. And we can see that at the lower binder concentration, the particles have a rougher surface with protrusions coming off of them. At the higher binder content, the particles appear much smoother. From a morphology standpoint, the binder is act acting to coat the NMC surface and make the surface smoother. This allows the particles to move past one another easier and correlates to the lower cohesion, the lower yield strength, but a higher flow function because they can flow past each other easier. So this is just an example of how we can correlate bulk powder properties that are gonna be important in processing to the microstructure of the particles. The bulk flow ability of the cathode powder is also analyzed using the flow cell. The results from the flow experiments are shown on the right. In a flow experiment, there are two types of flow analyzed, analyzed the confined flow and the unconfined flow. The confined flow is defined as the rotor moving down where there's a confining bottom surface, while the unconfined flow is when the rotor is moving upwards. In both cases, the total flow energy is gonna be higher when more binder is present in the system. We can again go back to imaging to explain this, and we can couple it to EDS or energy dispersive spectroscopy. The images on the left show the cathode powder with the highest binder content. It observed the binder, which is the yellow signal in between the particles shown here, which is coming from the carbon in the highly carbon content PVDF, acts to bridge the inorganic particles together. The bulk flow ability of powders is gonna be influenced by the particle size and the particle shape. So this binding effectively increases the powder particle size and produces non-spherical shapes. And this is acting to increase the energy input needed for the bulk flow ability of the powder. And summarize this powder section. A benefit of using this TA powder testing accessory is the semi-automated flow and shear testing where we have predefined methods that are easily modifiable already available in the TRIO software.
It guides you through the experiment and makes it very simple. In addition to this, the analysis is automated with one click. In the example below, we have the raw data on the left from a shear, a shear experiment using the shear cell. And this can be easily converted into the more circles with annotated analysis with one click and it can be done within seconds. Thanks, Mark. So like Mark said, generally all these powdered solids get mixed and dispersed in a solvent to form a slurry. Uh, there's some important aspects of the slurry that should be characterized in order to ensure an efficient process and a consistent product, such as the solid content, the shear viscosity, the thixotropy, the stability. Uh, so stability both in terms of uh, resistance to settling as well as uh, degradation over time and then the drying kinetics. So we're gonna talk about how rheology can be used to assess the shear viscosity, the thixotropy, and the stability of these slurries. The slurries are complex structured fluids that contain a continuous phase, such as a solvent or water, and a dispersed phase. In the case of battery slurries, the dispersed phase consists of the active material, conductive additives, such as carbon black, and a polymeric binder that forms a weak three-dimensional structure. Structured fluids generally exhibit certain rheological properties. Um, they are non-Newtonian, meaning that the viscosity is dependent on shear rate, uh, usually their shear thinning. They exhibit a yield stress, which means they will not flow until a certain stress has been exceeded. They are thixotropic, meaning that uh, they take a finite time to recover their structure after shearing. And they are viscoelastic, meaning they exhibit properties of both an elastic solid and a viscous liquid. Uh, so having a high solvent content reduces the viscosity, thereby making mixing and processing easier. But like Mark mentioned, uh, it also leads to more energy and time required for the drying process, which is very energy intensive. So oftentimes the solvent can be toxic as well. So reducing the solvent content is one way to make the process more environmentally sustainable. It's important to study and understand the rheologic behavior of these slurries in order to aid in production and development. Rheological testing can characterize both the viscosity, which is the material property of resistance to flow, um, that can be characterized as a function of shear rate or stress, as well as time and temperature, and the viscoelasticity, which is the property of a material that exhibits both viscous and elastic character. So that can be characterized by the elastic or storage modulus, G prime, uh, the viscous and loss module or loss modules, G delta prime, and then the damping factor, which is tan delta. It's the ratio of the loss modulus to the storage modulus. So the way the rheometer works is that it uh, applies a force to the sample uh, as that force is applied, the sample is displaced a certain amount. That's the delta X you see in the schematic. And it's displaced with a certain rate as well. So from these three signals, the force, the displacement, and the displacement rate, we can calculate parameters that are more useful to us as scientists and rheologists. For example, the shear stress is calculated from the force. The shear strain is calculated from the displacement. And the shear rate is calculated from the displacement rate. And we can further define some useful ratios, such as the viscosity, which is the ratio of the shear stress to the shear rate, and the modulus, which is the ratio of the shear stress to the shear strain. So some advantages of using the rheometer to do characterization are that we can correlate rheological behavior to the material structure. We can directly measure the flow viscosity. We can monitor stability. We can characterize formulations and we can guide processing conditions. So there are two common modes in which people operate the rheometer. That's flow and oscillation. Uh, in flow mode, the rotor is going to rotate in a single direction like you see in the video. It's also called unidirectional testing. And as the rotator, uh, as the rotor is rotating, uh, we can get a measurement of the viscosity. So we can measure viscosity um, as a function of time. This is often done as a single rate or a single stress test. That's the first graph you see at the bottom. So we're applying 
um, a, a constant shear rate or constant shear stress, and we're seeing how the viscosity uh, uh, changes with time. And we uh, typically will reach an equilibrium state. We can also determine thixotropy, um, assessing viscosity as a function of time. When we're assessing viscosity as a function of shear stress or shear rate, oftentimes we're trying to get a flow curve. So this is would be a carrier and viscosity over a wide range of shear rates. Often this is done in a stepped or steady state flow test. So that's the second graph you see at the bottom. So here we're um, applying a wide range of shear rates. Uh, starting, starting at uh, one shear rate, we're getting an equilibrium data point for viscosity. Then we're stepping up to the next uh, shear rate, getting a viscosity point there, then going on to the next one, getting our viscosity, and on and on. Uh, we can also determine yield stress by measuring viscosity as a function of stress, as well as uh, thixotropy. Then finally, we can um, assess viscosity as a function of temperature by doing a temperature ramp. When we conduct oscillatory tests, we're characterizing the viscoelastic behavior of our material. So in flow mode, we're determining the viscosity. In oscillatory mode, we're determining the viscoelasticity. So in an oscillatory test, the rotor is going to oscillate back and forth like you're seeing in the video. The distance that it's oscillating is called the amplitude, and the speed with which it is oscillating is called the frequency. So in an oscillatory test, we are applying either an oscillatory stress or an oscillatory strain, and we're going measuring the opposing signal. So for example, if we're applying a stress, we're going to measure the strain. If we're applying a strain, we're going to measure the stress. For um, a purely viscous material, there's going to be a... Um, a 90 degree phase lag between the applied signal and the measured signal. For a purely elastic material, there's going to be no phase lag between the applied signal and the measured signal. Uh, but for a viscoelastic material, the response is going to be somewhere in between those two extremes. So you're going to get a phase angle that is somewhere between zero and 90 degrees. And what that uh, phase angle, that, that delta, is, is a great uh, metric for characterizing viscoelasticity. So there are several tests we can do in oscillation mode. We can do an amplitude sweep. Uh, so this is used to measure the linear viscoelastic region. We can also determine yield stress or stability from an amplitude sweep. We can do a time sweep. This is a very common test for assessing stability. And we can also uh, determine thixotropy from a time sweep if it is preceded by a, a step shear. If we can do a frequency sweep, this is probably the most common test in oscillatory mode. So this test is used to compare viscoelasticity of different formulations or different batches or different grades. And this test can also be used to investigate the material's microstructure. And finally, we can do a temperature ramp as well to characterize viscoelasticity as a function of temperature. So when we're determining viscosity of a material, it's often helpful to get the viscosity over a wide range of shear rates. And that's because different processes correlate to different shear rates. So here's a flow curve of a general structured fluid and the shear range for some common processes. So for example, at low shear rates below say, um, let's say one reciprocal seconds, uh, we see uh, processes like sedimentation, we can analyze leveling and sagging of our, uh, of our structured fluid. At uh, medium shear rates, say um, above one or above, above 10 reciprocal seconds, we see processes like mixing and some coatings. Then at very high shear rates above uh, say a thousand reciprocal seconds, we can see processes like spraying or brushing. So here we generated flow curves for two different anode slurries with different graphite particles. So one had natural graphite and the other had uh, synthetic graphite. So um, based on the graph, we can see that the natural graphite had a higher viscosity than the synthetic graphite throughout the range of, of uh, shear rates. Uh, they're both shear, shear thinning materials, um, but looking at the uh, so looking at the graph and the relevant uh, shear rate ranges, we can see that the 
since the natural graphite had a higher uh, viscosity at the low shear rates, that's going to correlate to more, more stability and better, better storage stability. So that's going to be more resistant to sedimentation and settling. Uh, however, for uh, medium shear rates to correlate to, to mixing, the synthetic graphite has a lower viscosity, so that's going to be easier to mix. And similarly, since the synthetic graphite has a lower viscosity at the high shear rates, uh, say 100 to 1,000 centimeters seconds, that means it's going to be easier for coating in a coating process such as using a slot die or a doctor blade. Um, and this is a great time to mention the difference between a rheometer and a viscometer. So a rheometer is going to give you this entire curve, whereas a viscometer is only going to give you a narrow range, say in the range of about 10 to 50 reciprocal seconds. So, so with a viscometer, you would really only be able to characterize the mixing behavior of your slurries. Um, and you wouldn't be able to characterize the storage condition uh, stability as well as the coating processes. Um, furthermore, doing this kind of test, we can help ensure batch to batch repeatability and it can help to understand the structure change during coating to optimize coating parameters. Yield stress is another important phenomenon exhibited by structured fluids. A yield stress fluid will not flow until a certain stress has been exceeded in the schematic that you see there. Uh, before that stress has been exceeded, um, the structure is at rest. And then after that stress is exceeded, the structure is destroyed. And typically you get shear thinning behavior. So having a yield stress can be beneficial in preventing settling and sedimentation. sedimentation. So here we measured the yield stress of two different diano slurries um, using a shear rate ramp down method. This method is appropriate for, for fluids with, with a low yield stress. So in this graph, we have viscosity and stress versus shear rate. We started with a high shear rate, um, 100 reciprocal seconds, and then we ramped down. And what we're looking for here is we're looking for a plateau in the stress. Um, and we're going to take that plateau as the yield stress value. And in the viscosity curve, we're also looking for a slope of minus one. So that indicates that we are, um, that this structure uh, has not yielded yet. So we see uh, with these two, um, with these two slurries that the natural graphite uh, slurry has a higher yield stress than the synthetic graphite slurry, 0.9 pascals versus 0.4. So this is going to indicate that the better stability and resist resistance to settling and sedimentation. This can also give an indication for pumpability of the slurry. So if we wanted to pump this slurry, it's going to take uh, more energy to get the uh, natural graphite slurry to begin to uh, flow. Thickness trophy is yet another important phenomenon exhibited by structured fluids. Thickness trophy is a time-dependent flow behavior where the structure takes a finite time to recover after it's uh, destroyed by shearing. So here we investigated a, um, a slurry, uh, the slurry's thickness trophy behavior by using what's called a three-step flow process. So, um, Looking at the graph, uh, in this process, first we start with a low shear rate. So uh, we use 0.1 reciprocal seconds, and we're doing this to determine the structure at rest. And then we're stepping up to a high shear rate to destroy the structure. So we use 10 reciprocal seconds here. Uh, and then we're going back down to our, uh, to our uh, low shear rate again to assess the recovery of the structure. So with these uh, uh, anode slurries, or with battery slurries in general, it's important to tune the thixotropic recovery. We don't want it to be too fast because then we may see leveling issues with a slurry and we won't get an even coating. And also we don't want it to be too slow because then we may see sagging or dripping of the slurry, which will also result in an uneven coating. And we can further define what's called a thixotropic index to quantify shear thinning. So this is defined as the viscosity in the first step divided by the viscosity in the second step. So 
the most common test to characterize the scholasticity of a material is the frequency sweep. The storage modulus represents the solid-like response and the loss modulus represents the liquid-like response. Low frequencies correlate to long time scale behavior and high frequencies correlate to short time scale behavior. So com comparing the two materials, we see here that they both have uh, they both have a high, um, higher G prime at the low frequencies compared to, um, compared to the loss modulus. The natural slurry has higher dynamic moduli throughout the frequency range. Um, but at the low frequencies in particular, we even see a plateau in the storage modulus indicating a weak network structure. Uh, G prime for the natural slurry is higher than that of the synthetic slurry, indicating that the network structure is going to be stronger for the natural slurry. Um, so this network structure help, helps prevent sagging and phase separation. As we go to higher frequencies, um, eventually we see a crossover point. And after this crossover, uh, G delo prime becomes higher than G prime, indicating that the uh, liquid-like behavior is more dominant. Um, so at these higher frequencies, um, the liquid-like behavior means that the uh, material is going to be easier to flow. And we don't have that uh, network structure anymore. So these slurries tend to be very unstable and degrade with time. They're generally used shortly after they're mixed. Here we investigated the shelf life stability of an anode slurry within an environmentally friendly CMC binder. It's carboxy methyl cellulose. So a CMC is a biodrag polymer and is considered a sustainable choice for polymeric binder. However, as can be seen, this slurry degrades very quickly. So looking at the graph on the left, we have our flow curve. We did uh, this measurement after uh, one day, three days, four days, and seven days after mixing. So we see that the viscosity reduces quite steadily with the aging time. Then on the right side, we have the low frequency G primes. We, we did a frequency sweep. Uh, the low frequency G prime is um, taken at 0.1 radians per second. And we also have the modulus crossover. And we see that both of them decrease quite steadily with the aging period. And we see that for the seven days aging, we actually don't even have a crossover, indicating we don't have um, a stable network with when we're aged seven weeks and seven days. The Rio IS accessory, short for rheological impedance spectroscopy, is our newest accessory for the HR rheometer. With this accessory, you can conduct simultaneous impedance and rheological testing. Looking at the schematic in the bottom left-hand corner, both electrodes for the impedance spectroscopy are on the bottom plate, which the sample sits on. There are no wires attached to the top plate, allowing for full rotation as well as oscillation testing. This allows you to characterize the conductive network at high shear rates encountered in processing, for example, Dr. Blade and slot die coating. The accessory comes with a 40 millimeter top plate, which can accommodate a wide range of slurry viscosities. Our TRIO software can report the Nyquist and Bode plots. The uh, Nyquist plot, which is reactance versus resistance, is shown for carbon paste at various shear rates. We see there's a strong dependence of the Nyquist plot on shear rates, and this indicates that the conductive network structure is not very stable. The ability to do impedance testing on the slurry itself will save valuable time and resources in qualifying new formulas, even doing QC testing. So generally, uh, the impedance testing is done only after the entire process of coding, drying, and calendaring is performed. So being able to do this characterization before that whole process will certainly be beneficial. So we discussed how rheology can be used to characterize uh, the powdered solids and mixed slurries in the battery manufacturing process. However, there are other important characterizations that can be made with our technologies as well um, across the entire process from the raw materials 
to the slurry to the final electrode stages. So in the incoming materials phase, uh, we can use TGA to assess thermal stability as well as purity. Uh, we can use DSC to do QC testing on the binder, assess uh, glass transition and melting points of the binder. In the slurry stage, we can use TGA to determine solid content as well as drying kinetics. And in the finished electrode stage, we can use TGA to determine composition as well as do some evolved gas analysis. So this brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you for listening, and we'd be happy to take any questions at this point. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Let me bring you both back and we will start the audience Q&A. Uh, just before we do that, though, we do have a second poll. So if you could share your thoughts uh, of that poll, this should be appearing on your screen now. Mark, Sandeep, you still got me? You can hear me loud and clear? Oh, Sandeep, I think, you, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Perfect, got you now. Uh, okay, let's go through the questions. So this first one, Sandy, perhaps if I come to you first and then uh, Mark, feel free to jump in at any point. Uh, it's asking, is wall slip an issue with battery slurries? Uh, what recommend recommendations do you have to address it? Oh, Sandy, you're still on mute. One second, let me bring you back. Can you hear me? Gotcha. Yeah, that's a great question. So in uh, concentrated suspensions, like these battery slurries, um, a low viscosity layer can develop at the plate surfaces. Uh, so that creates a lubricating effect for the sample flying over it. Uh, the sample can slip as, as a result. Um, and this can manifest on the data as a decrease in the viscosity and shear stress. Uh, the effect is typically seen in steady flow tests at high shear rate. Um, but it can also occur in other tests as well, such as um, large amplitude oscillatory shear. Um, it's problematic at high angular velocities or large strain amplitudes in oscillatory tests. Uh, so there's a, there's a way to determine if you have wall slip, and that's you conduct your test at multiple uh, gap sizes. So you can vary your gap, say from you can use one millimeter gap, you can, and then you can do your same test at uh, you know, 600 microns and then uh, two millimeters, and you should get the same viscosity at, um, and it should be independent of the gap. Thank you. Um, then the, the common way to deal with um, wall slip is to use a geometry of the roughened surface. So TA offers sandblasted and cross hatch geometries for the HR rheometer. Uh, sandblasted geometries are appropriate for samples which exhibit mild or moderate wall slip, and then cross dash geometries are appropriate uh, for samples that exhibit severe wall slip. For battery slurries, uh, sandblasted plates are likely the appropriate choice if uh, wall slip is a concern. All right. All right, then Mark, how about I come to you for the, the next one? Uh, can rheology be used to detect um, agglomeration in a slurry and what effects would agglomeration have? Um, yeah, so You'll be able to see that, and this kind of relates to another question too, about how can powder analysis be re be related to um, slurry analysis. So in the powder, we talked about the cohesion. High cohesion means that you're probably going to have a lot of powder agglomeration. So if you know that before you're mixing, you're going to be mixing essentially large chunks into your solvent, and it's going to be harder to mix. Um, how we'll see this, we can see a difference in the viscosity, but you'll also get a difference in the frequency speeds from the oscillatory testing because your structures, your underlying structure is going to be different. So if you are realizing you seem to have um, inhomogeneous slurries, and then you can relate that to the frequency sweep signature, um, which basically tell you the underlying structure. Um, what's it exactly going to look like is going to be depend on the mixing problem, but uh, that's essentially, you can use it to uh, monitor that. Sure, good stuff. Uh, next one, Sandeep's asking, how can the Nucris plot be used to predict stability of the conductive network? Yeah, so um, the Nyquist plot is uh, reactance versus resistance. 
in a stable conductive network, there should not be a strong dependence on the shear rate. So we saw in the presentation that there were that last example where um, there was a Nyquist plot with a strong dependence on shear rate. So that's uh, that's generally not what you want to see. Right, and then this next one saying, uh, are parallel plates the best setup for conducting rheological testing on battery slurries? Yeah, I can do that as well. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, a cone and plate geometry is generally not a good setup for particle fluid fluids, and that's because the gap size cannot be adjusted on a cone and plate geometry. Um, the gap size is it's set as the truncation gap of the cone. So if a particle of fluid fluid with large particle sizes are used with a cone and plate geometry, it could cause grinding on the geometry. And it could also cause um, a squeeze flow effect that will impact the data. As a general rule of thumb, the gap should be at least 10 times larger than the largest particle size. And additionally, um, we don't provide cones with roughened surfaces. So if balsa was a concern, you wouldn't be able to get a sandblasted cone and you can be able, be able to uh, mitigate or eliminate that wall slip effect. Uh, so yeah, the geometry of choice would be um, parallel plates. If also is a concern, the roughened plates are a good option, such as sandblasted. And uh, you generally see that a 40 millimeter plates are the most appropriate for the kinds of viscosities that we see with these battery slurries. Awesome. Uh, we'll get through a few more questions in just a moment. Just a reminder, if we don't have time to get to your question today, um, we'll pass them on to Mark and Sanik to follow up your email at a later date. Uh, a reminder that if you are watching this on demand, then you can still ask questions, but obviously you'll get a reply uh, via email to that. Um, this next one, Mark, how about, how are you for this? How, how powder rheology or how can powder rheology measurements can correlate with optimizing or characterizing solvent-based slurries? Yeah, so kind of like um, I talked about before, um, we mentioned cohesion, yield strain, all of these powder properties that we can determine from this accessory. And essentially, you're going to see how there's going to be a difference in the, when you make the slurry, how well the powders mix. If you have something that's extremely high cohesion, high yield strength, so it takes a lot of energy to make it flow, you're going to have to input more energy and in to get it properly hooked homogenize it to the slurry. So knowing the underlying powder properties before the mixing process, if you're using a solvent based slurry system, um, we'll just, it'll give you more information to make, um, more adequate determinations of how to mix the powders, um, how to join everything together. If you've ever seen, um, anyone who's made an anode, uh, if you take the graphite, the carbon black, and then the polymer powder, just handling those powders, they're three very, very different um, textures. And and uh, the carbon black is extremely light powder. Graphite's more dense. So knowing those powder properties before you go into the mixing process just helps you optimize it so it's properly homogenized, which is going to lead to a homogenized electrode um, in the later stages. Awesome. Uh Quick note for the audience that there is a handout to download on the left hand side of your screen. You should see an ebook there. So please do download that before you before you leave today. Um, and once we are finished, there will be a survey appearing on your screen. So please do share your feedback with us uh, before you finish up. Uh, I can see one more question, guys, for the time being. Uh, Sandy Pants, I come to you for this. Uh, what are sample size requirements for powder versus slurry testing with the neurometer? Yeah. Um, so for slurry testing, with uh, if you're using the recommended 40 millimeter plates, uh, generally you don't you don't need that much. Maybe you need two millimeters of sample. Uh, generally, you want to load excess so then you can um, trim the sample and get a fully filled gap. Uh, for our powder um, powder accessory, we have different cups depending on the test you're going to do. So the and the cups are different sizes. So for the uh, there's a cup for the flow cell and then a cup for the shear cell. Um, I'll let uh, Mark comment on the volume of those cups. Yeah, that's going to be about 20 grams a sample, I'd say. Something like that for a normal powder that you would handle. If you look at that, um, the cup right there on the bottom, um, that would be basically a parallel plate. And then that entire cup is filled with the powder because it's a bulk measurement. So it is significantly more powder required than 
compared to doing parallel play slurry testing. So, All right, perfect. Good stuff, gents. I think we'll wrap things up there. Um, just final few notes that there will be a link with the recording coming into everyone's inboxes within the next 24 hours. So if you have missed anything, you can watch back anything, share with your teams, uh, et cetera. Uh, please do share your feedback on that survey that will appear on your screen in just a moment and do download that ebook before before you leave today. Uh, Mark, Sandeep, any final final thoughts before we finish up? Yep. No. Thank you, everybody. For yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, thanks again to everyone in the audience for, for joining you from across the world. Mark, Sandeep, appreciate your time and thanks for sharing your expertise with everyone. Hopefully see everyone again very soon and I wish you all a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you.